Let's talk about a common question that I get asked probably a couple of times a month, and that's regarding scenarios with Azure Firewall, VDI solutions on Azure, such as Azure Virtual Desktop, and outbound internet access through the firewall, going to SaaS services like M365, and the considerations we have around SNAT port utilization. So let's think about our diagram, get our bearings. We've got down the bottom here, our VDI VNet or collection of VNets. And in this example, I've got a collection of nodes. It's quite common for customers on Azure to migrate their entire VDI platform in, and they could have thousands, tens of thousands of users. And for resilience, we'll spread across multiple availability zones. But let's imagine you've got, say, 10,000 users down the bottom here. And we have to appreciate that VDI users are very different to virtual machines and containers um, because we're, we're comparing a user, a human user versus a machine. And the outbound profile will be very different. The human contacting addresses on the internet will be doing interactive things like accessing SaaS services, browsing the internet, browsing news sites, browsing social media, etc., etc. So the requirements for security, scale, and outbound usage of the, the internet egress point are very different for machines versus users. So we typically want to, when we bring VDI into the cloud, we want a solution to control that internet egress. Here I'm showing Azure Firewall as that chosen solution. I'm going to shape all of my traffic from my VDI nodes via a UDR typically to the Azure Firewall. And I'm using the standard SKU here for VDI deployments. You typically use the premium SKU to get outbound PLS termination, IDPS, etc., which are very uh, common requirements for, for outbound user filtering. But for the purposes of this discussion, which is around SNAP port utilization, doesn't really matter too much what firewall SKU we're talking about. And the, the general idea is we send traffic from a private IP on a, an Azure VDI node to the Azure firewall. And then the destination is something on the internet. So before we put that traffic on the internet, we need to source NAT it to be a public IP, which is now routable on the internet before we send that traffic out to the, the SaaS service. And then the SaaS service responds back to the the Azure Firewall public IP address and the firewall maintains the state and keeps track of, well, what was my internal IP address? What was the port it was coming from? What's the port it's coming back on? It un unravels those snap translations and maintains the, the state tables internally. And all of that processing, you know, takes compute cycles. And also there's a, a scaling factor under the covers here, which is, well, for outbound usage via a public IP, there's only a certain number of ports available per public IP. That gives us a consideration here. So one of the things we need to consider is you get a maximum of 2,496 SNAP ports per public IP. And if you're familiar with some of the formalities of the Azure standard load balancer, you'll know when you set up outbound access through a load balancer, you get a certain number of ports based on how many backend nodes you have, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not like you, you have one public IP, you get 64,000 ports. It's very much a case you need to be aware of with one public IP, you get 2,496 ports. We call this out in a couple of places. We've got a dedicated document within the Azure Firewall docs for scale outbound snap ports, 2496 snap ports per public IP. There's also a nod to this inside of the overall Azure limits, public IPs, talks about 250 maximum on an Azure firewall and the fact that that contributes to the available snap ports. Now, most customers, when they deploy an Azure firewall, like I've done here, will just deploy it with the, the default configuration where you get one public IP address and then sort of forget about it. And normally that's not really an issue. You know, if you're working with majority of machines here in the back end that are going through Azure Firewall, you probably will never hit that limit because there's not a huge amount of outbound connections. But for VDI, as we talked about, 
it's a different story. There's lots more outbound connections. If you've got a big VDI farm and you deployed Azure Firewall with one public IP, you can very quickly hit this limit. And that's why I'm making this video because we want to sort of educate those designs on how we can get around that. So just to highlight why we might hit the limit, well, consider a service like Office 365. It's very hard to guess exactly how many outbound ports per user will be active at any one time, but uh, you can get an idea. So in the documentation for uh, M365, there's some figures thrown around like four to six ports per user active at any one time. But also you need to remember that a user won't just be accessing M365, they'll be accessing all of the websites and the machines themselves. We make it outbound calls. Let's just throw a figure out there. I had a quick check on my machine. I've got uh, 30 outbound connections at the moment. But let's say 25 outbound connections for a typical user. If I take my, say, as rounded up, 2,500 SNAP ports divided by 25 ports each, that only gives me the support for 100 VDI users or my firewall becomes saturated in terms of outbound SNAP ports. And when that happens, we'll see connection failures internally from those users. The good news is we can monitor this so on my firewall here. If I go inside of the metrics blade, see here I've got SNAP port utilization. And we give a, a percentage breakdown here. I'm not actually pushing anything through my firewall, but this will give you an idea. Uh, one of the definite recommendations we have is especially if you've got a, an Azure firewall that's been used for VDI, make sure you set up the monitoring of this metric. So you can create alerts based on any Azure monitor metric. We want to be monitoring here and probably set an alert for anything above 50%. So let's say now we have identified, we've got a problem. We've got this big VDI farm down here and we've got, let's say 10,000 VDI users. And we know we're going to have a problem. If I've got 10,000 VDI users, we can roughly work out how many snap ports we need. 10,000 users times 25 average ports in use equals a quarter of a million snap ports. And if we divide that figure by 2496, you get roughly a requirement for 100 outbound public IPs. And this is possible. The, the Azure Firewall, as this uh, article says, does scale up to 1.25 million available snap ports. That's because we can apply lots and lots of IP addresses to the, to the firewall. That's one solution, which is to add more IP addresses to the outside of the firewall. So let's have a look at that. So here I've got my existing IP address, this uh, 20.126 address. I could go in here, add the second pip that I've already provisioned and click on add. We can see now I've got those two IP addresses here. So I can go back to my diagram and I know now I've got you know, double this amount. I've got roughly 5,000 SNAP ports now. So I've got this IP address as well on my firewall. This is where we need to think about our allow listing because now when our VDI traffic goes to the firewall, it's going to be snatted to either this IP or this IP before it goes to my SaaS service. So if I was applying inbound ACLs or allow listing on my remote SaaS service, I now need to come in and update those lists to include this one and this one. So you can see how this could become a manual effort if you were adding IP addresses. It's very easy to get those out of sync, especially if you're using lots of remote SaaS services. A possible optimization here is that these public IPs that you're assigning, you can provision them from what we call a public IP prefix. That's a pre-reserved block of IPs that are contiguous. Here's one that I've provisioned. You can see over here, I've got this 20.86.230.16/28. That range is going to give me 16 usable IP addresses, and that's the largest that we allow when we provision um, by default via the portal. But that still gives you a bit of flexibility. If you think about this ahead of time and you provision a firewall with 16 IPs, all from this block, 
when you give this range to your third party, you can say, just allow this contiguous block. That's quite easy for them to manage rather than here are these 16 different random IP addresses. So those are our first two options. You can, we can add individual IPs, which will be random. And we can add up to 16 IPs from a public IP prefix. You can obviously add more up to that 250 limit. And that takes us up to just over a million SNAP ports, which is going to be enough for most VDI deployments on Azure, especially when a lot of VDI deployments are you know, multi-region and they'll be using different firewalls. Therefore, you've got different points of scaling for SNAP. And everything I've talked about so far is compatible with this approach of I'm using multiple availability zones in the region for my VDI nodes. I've deployed my firewall across availability zones. So here on my firewall, when I deployed it, I made sure I ticked the box for AZs 1, 2, and 3. That means I know behind the scenes I've got coverage there. So if I was to lose an AZ in a region, my VDI compute's still running. My UDR is still pointing to a resource that still is alive in some of those zones which are still running. Therefore, my end to end compute storage network story is aligned. And that getting out of sync is, is a common problem we see on Azure. And I mentioned the availability zones because when we talk about the next option, which is NAT gateway, we need to keep in mind this availability zone story. So again, I'll put the link to this document, which explains a lot of the nuances here regarding scaling SNAP ports with the NAT gateway. But in simple terms, what we can do here is we can change that story we talked about earlier, where one public IP equals 2,500 SNAP ports, kind of similar to the, the load balancer structure we might be familiar with. Now with NAT gateway, you can drop in that gateway on the Azure Firewall subnet. Imagine here this firewall's in a VNet and this firewall's also in a subnet. And on that subnet, we can deploy that gateway. And as soon as we do that, a few things happen. One is the snap port utilization of nodes going out to the internet changes. And again, I'll leave links to the, the NAT gateway documentation, but fundamentally, this, this now changes from a more fixed model where every node in the back end gets a certain sort of portion of snap ports, which they can use. We sort of pre-allocate ports to all possible backends to it's kind of first come, first serve, all you can eat. And you can go up to roughly 65,000 snap ports for a single public IP. So one of the options here is you leave a single public IP on the firewall and you enable that gateway and straight away without assigning any more public IP to the firewall, you have a lot more snap ports. You sort of times the two and a half thousand there by what nearly 25, 25 X your snap port uh, outbound for VDI without having to give your remote SAS vendors another public IP. And with that gateway, you can, assign IP prefixes and you can have up to 16 IP addresses. So the maths are kind of similar. With, with that gateway, you can have 16 IPs. Each one gives you 65K ports equals, you know, over roughly over a million. With the older model that we talked about, you can have 250 IPs and each one gives you uh, a certain number of uh, ports, which equals roughly over 1 million as well. So that the, the total figure of outbound ports that you can get by either adding public IPs or using that gateway similar, but the pros and cons are different. With the public IP model, you've got a lot more public IPs to pay for and use and give to your remote third parties and manage the adding of them and the public IP prefixes. You'll have some sort of discontinuity of, of the ranges. Whereas with that gateway, you can achieve a lot more with fewer public IPs. However, the big Thing to consider with NAT Gateway is around zone resilience. So NAT Gateway today, when you provision it, for example here, if I was to deploy a new NAT Gateway for my firewall, I have to pick an availability zone. And when I deploy my firewall, I could choose availability zones one, two, and three and spread it across all AZs. With 
in that gateway, I have to either pick a zone, either one, two, or three, or choose no zone, and then under the covers, it will just get thrown in a random zone. What I can't do today is spread it across all zones and have parity with how I've deployed my firewall. What that means fundamentally is I've solved my snap port utilization with NAT gateway, but I've now got to consider how would I handle a zonal failure? Because in a zone down scenario, let's say I've got my AZ resilience on my firewall. Let's say zone one goes down. Okay, my VDIs are lost in zone one. My Azure firewall is lost in zone one. Two and three are okay, two and three are okay. If my NAT gateway, if I happen to have deployed it in zone one, then I've lost my NAT gateway function. I've lost my outbound access. I would have to accept the fact I need to redeploy a new NAT gateway in the new zone uh, during that failure scenario. And a lot of customers want a more automated experience than that. So that's the big one to call out. Uh, in fact, in this document here around uh, scaling, we do call this out in big purple lettering around, um, you know, it's not a recommended deployment option as a NAT gateway does not support zonal deployments. So definitely want to consider if you if you've got a zonal model uh, throughout the stack there. But hopefully that gives you a flavor now for combining Azure Firewall with large scale VDI and some of the options that you have and some of the you know, realistic figures that you might have when you cross over those tipping points. Here's a little addition, by the way, which is showing some of the, the plumbing or the migration uh, method you might use to go from having a firewall here with a single public IP to move to NAT gateway and retain that public IP. So here I've got the firewall using that, that single IP address. Note the, uh, the name of it and uh, the, the IP. So 164.47, last two octets. First thing I'm going to do is to change this pip temporarily to be that, that second pip that I talked about. And I'm doing this because I can't just simply delete the original pip from the firewall and have a firewall with no pip. It won't allow me to do that. For this small period of time, I'm going to transition the firewall to a temporary IP address. Of course, during this time, if I was using allow listing on that SAS service, my connections to it will fail. So there's a period here of maintenance and downtime you need to be aware of. So my firewall is now transitioned to that temporary IP address. Remember, my original was 164.47. So I'm going to go ahead and make my NAT gateway now. And when I do that, I'm going to choose my original IP, which is now available, the 164.47 range. Choose my Azure Firewall subnet as the destination of my NAT gateway. And now that my NAT gateway is deployed, we could update our diagram now to highlight what's happened. We transitioned the actual firewall's IP address to be this temporary, not used anymore, but still required for things like management of the firewall, this 183.47. This will never be used now for outbound connections from my users. You can sort of think of traffic going into the firewall and then going through the NAT gateway. And we provisioned the NAT gateway with our original firewall IP, this 164.47 IP address. As we can see here, tied to my that gateway. And uh, as long as I accept all of the availability zone caveats we talked about, we've transitioned our firewall to using that gateway. Uh, and the way this works behind the scenes with that gateway is documented further in the NAT gateway documentation. Specifically here, the bit we're leveraging is NAT gateway takes precedence over other outbound methods. Anyway, hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.